something like 5,000 hours of suppressed material 24 hours a day month after month and at a time when even the idiots and the deniers are struggling to dismiss the fact that this world is going down a very dark and dangerous road to work so hard to destroy a station and in this case take it off air to stop information exposing that to coming out that is in my view a severe form of mental illness and schizophrenia the emails I'll tell you what we had to deal with the emails of the people's voice were hacked into and I'll give you an example there's a, a, an agency in London which uh, provides television staff and media staff for stations so if you need uh, someone to fill a job like a backroom job then you, you go to them and, and it's an agency to, to find people those that hacked into the TPV emails then started sending abusive emails to this agency to the point obviously the agency thought it was coming from TPV and basically they said no more and that was just part of what we were facing they went to advertisers there were some of them were abusive to advertisers but they went to advertisers urging them not to advertise with us and as a result of that uh, a number of advertisers but well don't want to know then and then you had of course all the all the abuse at the station and advertisers were going oh i'm staying out of that so ironically these people who are going well yeah what happened and what these all that stuff the the the, the vitriol people were fundamental in denying uh, TPV the income lifeblood that would have gone on to fulfill and carry on what we did fulfill at the start which is what we said we would and, and you know some of it was almost funny um, in, a, in a, an ironic sort of way do you know that, that one, of the, one of the people who, who was abusing the station and abusing individuals, including members of my old family, was a man called Lee Ryan. This is Sonia Poulton's boyfriend. Lee Ryan is a convicted car thief, been to jail for it. And he is best known for winning £6.5 million on the national lottery and blowing it all on himself in just a ridiculously few years and this guy's going what happened to the money yeah what happened to the money Ryan Ferraris and mansions wasn't it we had people there's a, a, a lady called I think it was named Sharon Gifford someone um someone painted a picture of, uh, of me um, it's it's up there big picture um, and very kindly and they gave it to me and it was just on, on against the wall in my office um, this Sharon Gifford, who worked on Sonia Poulton's program for a while, um, had to be um, restrained <laughs> as she stood at the lift with the painting under her arm. I wasn't there at the time. Announcing she was going to go and set light to it. I mean, you really couldn't make up some of the people that came and thankfully went. And you know, you know when you're in a... Um, you're in one of these you know, amusement arcades, and you know those things where, where you, there's, there's a hammer and heads come up and you have to hit that, and then another one comes up. It was a bit like that. You know, we had people um, who would leave and slag, slag everybody off, and people who were still there would go, well, that's terrible. That's someone who, who, who took money from the station, was paid and treated nicely, and, and now, now they go off and they're, they're trashing this. And then, 
a few weeks down the road, the people who said that would go and do the same. <laughs> it's extraordinary. When you've got um, forums and websites just set up to, 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 to trash, pe trash people and the station, it, it, it's just extraordinary. I mean, have these people seen the world? Have they seen what's going on? And they talk about, oh, what about all the abused children? Yes, what about him? What about him? The self-obsession and the me, me, me attitude was shocking. There were, like I say, there were some lovely people there who did have the ethos. But I used to sit there and look around that office and see the behaviour, see the little, see the, the Poltons and the Elisa Hawks and, and, and others in their little clique plotting. Oh, shh, shh, shh. What about earlier? And I thought, this is supposed to be an adult station acting in a mature way and in so many cases not least on on your pool was like dealing with a child who'd yet to get through the terrible twos um yeah Sonia Poulton and her groupies embarked on a campaign to destroy TPV and to destroy me. And all these months down the road, Sonia Poulton's legendary capacity for resentment um, apparently has led her to um, be putting together a Ike expose uh, called Unmasking the Messiah. Now, just take that, Unmasking the Messiah. That is straight from some tabloid crap, um, which she says she's against. So, Unmasking the Messiah. Um, she's going to try to damage me maximally because her need for revenge and the the hatred in her heart for someone who actually faced her up and said your behavior is not acceptable because most people are intimidated by her and, and, and wouldn't do that her hatred and need for revenge um is leading her to try to use the TPV to destroy me and to paint me as some kind of ogre. He's not like he seems. Well, neither are you, darling, unless you see yourself close up. Um, and she's going around talking to people. And when uh, people from TV, TVV are approached and they say, well, actually, no, I thought it was a nice place to work. And I thought David Icke was a nice bloke. They don't get in the film. <laughs> um, and it's being put out through an organization called the Community Press Group. It's based in Potter's Bar, north of London, which is um, headed by a police officer, or a, a career police officer called Dave Eden. And the Community Press Group was created in the same period that the People's Voice was created. Um, and now runs um, its operation under this guy, Dave Eden. And with Sonia Poulton is promising that they are going to unmask me. In other words, they are going to attempt to cause me maximum damage and hope of hopes destroy me in what I do in terms of my ability to continue. 
Now, say what you like about me, and most people do. I was doing this when almost no one else was doing it. Over the last 25 years, I have taken scales of ridicule and abuse of historic proportions. One guy. From the days of not being able to walk down the street without virtually everyone in the street laughing at me. From the days when it was impossible to go into a pub because there was uproar and ridicule. When you did talks at universities and it was 15 minutes on uh, uh, one occasion before I could start speaking because of the abuse and the ridicule coming from the audience. From that time, we've moved through to now, yeah, ridicule still, but far less because what I've been writing about is happening. But now to abuse. My family have been abused. My kids have been uh, uh, abused uh, by, by, by journalists following them to school by um, people on the internet and what have you. And through all that period of 25 years of it, I've kept going. And you will not understand what it has been like to be the focus of such extraordinary levels of abuse and ridicule over a quarter of a century. And you won't know what it's like because you have to experience it to know what it's like. And Almost no one else ever has in the extremes and the time scale that I have. And through it all, I've kept going. My God, the times I just wanted to walk away and disappear. But you can't, because when you know what the plan is and you look, kids, young people, and people who are not young, and you realize what's coming and what their lives will be like, especially the kids and the young people. Giving up is not an option because you can't live with yourself if you did. Well, I couldn't. So I've been knocked down and knocked down and knocked down and knocked down and you keep getting up and you keep moving forward and somehow you do move forward. And um, we've reached the point now where because of all the information that I put out over the years, which was overwhelmingly met with ridicule and abuse and dismissal when it went out there. Things are happening in the world, like the, the, the political paedophilia uh, revelations that are happening in this country. They were in my books years ago, like The Biggest Secret in 1998. People are now starting to say, well, hold on a minute. Let's look at what else this guy has said. And we're starting to see the cracks, starting to see some, some encouragement, some hope that this wall of oppression and secrecy would be breached fatally. At that very time, Sonia Putin and the community press group headed by this former policeman, Dave Eden, are planning 
to do their damnedest to destroy me and what I do. Who benefits from that, Ms. Poulton? Who benefits from that, Mr. Eden? Who benefits is the very system you two claim to be challenging. Emphasis on the claim, by the way. And um, in the last few weeks, I probably came as close as I've ever come to saying, all right, I'll leave you to it then. All the best. I'm going to live out my life quietly. Do what I want to do. Do some things for me for a change. So, so freaking tempting because I could do it, but I won't because I started a journey 25 years ago and I'm bloody well going to finish it and it will only end when I do. But I am sickened that people who claim to be fighting for justice, fighting for the oppressed, are so full of hatred, hostility, and the need for revenge that they would try to damage as best they can someone who has done more to alert the world to what's really going on than almost anyone else on the planet. And compared with their contribution I've already done more to alert people to the truth of the world on so many levels than they, Eden, Poulton, the Poulton groupies and all these other abusers will do if they live to be a thousand. But that's what you're dealing with. Frauds and fakes and it will massively backfire. So when you have been the biggest donator, massively so, to the people's voice, when you had the idea to create it, when you gave um, six, seven months full time to it and never took a cent for my trouble, then you end up being painted the villain. That is, if we needed it, still further confirmation that the world is bloody insane. Bloody madhouse. Let me make uh, through these notes. I, don't, I wanted to cover it, cover everything. Um, yeah, um, you know, I talk about um, banging um, the heads up as they come up. There's always someone. Well, that's gone on right, right to the end. Um, because I came back home on March the 1st, as I said I would from the start. And my goodness me, it's a bloody good job I did. Because um, davidlight.com and... Uh, related operations were were in a, a, a poor state due to neglect not least on behalf of the webmaster as was um, so I've been working with a new web, web team to turn everything around and it's just been fantastic it's turned around really quickly and we're gonna go on doing it because it's being loved again it's being cared for again it's being focused on again um, but I have been watching from a distance 
and having me two penneth here and there when I thought it was necessary. And um, a bookkeeper, a part-time bookkeeper, um, was appointed right at the start, a person I knew had great integrity. And very diligent, very honest, um, outstanding. And then I heard that she'd been fired by Sean Adams a few weeks ago now. And I pointed out that that wasn't acceptable and where are you going to go from here in terms of bookkeeping. Um, I then received uh, an email back which was at the bottom it had his name Sean Adel but had clearly not been written by him it was actually been written by his marriage partner a guy called Sinclair and since uh, that partnership um, Sinclair who's from America has been given more and more influence at the People's Voice even appearing on Richie Allen's show um, I don't know why, because the guy is absolutely clueless on the information that TPV was set up to communicate. And it was only going to end one way, with someone who had no idea about the media and no idea about, um, about the information that TPV is there to put out. It was only going to end one way. And I got this email, it was clearly written by the Sinclair bloke, um, saying that actually... Um, Sean Adel owned the company it was his company well it wasn't it's he was a custodian and that was known all along he was only a director because the company had to be set up like that for reasons I've explained he was custodian so I got this and it, it, it was that um, you know basically you're not having any, any say anymore and at that point um, clearly I had to point that out to people which I did on my website because um, I could see where it was going um, with this Sinclair bloke um, having so much influence. And um, I must say that um, I've known Sean Adel a long time, but I don't know the Sean Adel that I've seen in the last few weeks um, um, since that marriage uh, happened. So I don't know, maybe you can explain, but I'm not the only one that's seen it. So we come to this point and um, I know as much as you do. Um, I understand that he's he's put the um, he's the TPB into liquidation, but only he um, can answer those questions. I'm from a distance uh, now, and you know there has been you know lots of allegations that, that money was here, money was there, or whatever, and and like it's the machine gun approach. I mean, when you've got a situation where I've been accused of using TPV to fund my cocaine habit, uh, when I actually don't have a cocaine habit, and I have never written a single check for a single penny, or moved any money out of the TPV bank account. Even once. Never. It wasn't my area. It wasn't my role. I, my, my role was content. But they fire these things at you. Another uh, moronic um, man who needs psychiatric help said that I used the money to buy a house in Islington. Well, even with the donations that P TPV got, you, you don't buy a house in Islington for that kind of money. It's madness. So there's this machine gun approach. But I'll say this. If anyone, including Putin, has any evidence that money um, went to where it shouldn't have gone, not innuendo, not, I've heard, evidence, this is what they need to do. They need to take it to the police and they need to seek the prosecution of the person involved. And no one will back them more than me.
if they produce that evidence and take it to the police. But instead, what's happening is that the need for revenge and the need for um, their hatred to be expressed means that they're just trying to focus it all on me. The guy who never took a penny and put thousands and thousands in to support it financially. Why? Well, I'm the best known person there publicly, so therefore, you know, that, that's a motivation. Motivation for Sonia Poulton is that I called her out as a diva and um, and that, that you don't do that. I must destroy him. But are there any other reasons? Are there any re other reasons to try to undermine and destroy the work of someone who is actually exposing, at the very cutting edge, exposing what's happening in the world at a time when so many people in power want me out of the way? Worth asking, I think. Let's just see if, um, I think we're nearly there now. Um, no, that's it. Um, so, I say to the people that donated, in fact, I'm saying to myself as the biggest donator, um, thank you for supporting People's Voice. And when we went on air on November the 25th, 2013, we um, were fulfilling virtually everything that we said we would within months of saying it. It was an extraordinary achievement. But once the vitriol and the campaign of abuse and attempts to destroy it started, um, it was in a death spiral, which barring some person coming in and saying, I'll sponsor this, sponsor that, was going to end like it's ended. But, you know, you know when people are putting the greater good first. Because no matter what happens, no matter how they get kicked down, they get up and carry on. No matter how they don't like something that's happened, they get up and get on. When you are not putting the greater good first, but you're just claiming that, well, using the, the alleged greater good to benefit you. What happens then is when something happens you don't like, you want to destroy the subject of that, even though it's doing great work for the greater good in terms of communicating suppressed information. And again and again, I've seen that at the People's Voice, where people, oh yeah, we've got to do this, it's great. I mean, you know, on the, on the, the, the uh, two days before um, Sonia Poulton unleashed this campaign of vitriol against me, she was on, 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 on air going, oh, David Icke, he's wonderful, that's on, on, on any programs. Um, but when the greater good is your prop, not your prime focus, then you don't say, okay, it didn't work out. I didn't like what happened, but hey, they're putting out information 24 hours a day. You know, all the best. You don't do that. You want to destroy it. But when the greater good is your focus and something disappointing happens, like what's happened to the people's voice. Now, if they will do that, this they, then they will create terrorist attacks using mindless people who um, have no clue who their real masters are or who is really in control of their mind and I'll, I'll get to that before I finish. Um, they will do that because if they want to change society in a way that the public would massively resist if it was just openly offered, then they have to create 
uh, circumstances which change that public perception so that resistance to how they want to push the world on to this global Orwellian fascist dictatorship state will um, will be reduced that resistance will be reduced to make it easier for them to bring about what they want and that the public en masse would resist if they knew what was actually behind all this and then there's another uh, part of this which is if there's a few of you and as I've been pointing out all these years the number of people in full knowledge uh, of where this world is being taken and why and who's actually behind it is tiny compared with the target population tiny and because of compartmentalization the will of that few plays out through the system different levels with the vast majority of people who are working to play it out without any idea of what they're actually playing out or why because they only know their little bit in the compartmentalized structure they don't know how their bit connects to everyone else's bit to create a picture which can be clearly seen in terms of where this world is being taken and all you have to do is uh, look at the scale of surveillance the scale of the disappearing privacy to see that this is not about protecting us from terrorists this is about uh, creating this Orwellian global state that I've been writing about for so long and others like Orwell and Huxley uh, in Brave New World was were also writing about with extreme accuracy as it turns out so this other side of this increasing um, rapidly increasing number of terrorist attacks and shootings etc is because that tiny few have to manipulate a vast target population and if that target population has unity and has harmony amongst itself that's very very much more difficult to do than if you play different factions of your target population off against each other and when you kind of put the dots together well first of all in the United States with these shootings and attacks on policemen and uh, police officers and the uh, uh, the way that um, uh, police officers uh, have treated black people, or white people too, by the way, but black people um, many, many times. And of course, that's come to the fore in the last, um, last few weeks. Um, it's clear what's being done. The American society is being divided. Uh, systematically they want a race war it's 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 blatantly obvious and if you can have a, a, a race war uh, a, 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 a war in effect between um, one race and uh, police and one race and another race or whatever then you have the perfect situation for the few controlling the many because you have um, the target population fighting each other and that allows you to justify things that otherwise could not be justified like more and more control more and more surveillance um, more and more big brother Orwellian state to meet the problem of the race war and the inter-community conflict and then you move to Europe and um, you say you see the, the the obvious look at Chancellor Merkel and what she did in Germany the obvious decision um, to allow vast numbers of migrants to come into Europe um, in, in enormous numbers not to protect them from war and um, conflict like those coming out of Syria I mean hallelujah to that 
the West has created these conflicts on purpose, the same network that's behind what I'm talking about now. And uh, so, of course, we should um, look after the refugees of these conflicts that this Western cabal has created, of course. But that's not what happened. Vast numbers of others were allowed in at the same time who weren't fleeing from such things. And it was calculated. This is why uh, German people were just shocked that Merkel could open the doors and say everybody in. Because what they want is, uh, and it, it's, there's many levels to, to why this has happened. Um, and it all leads to the agenda I'm talking about. But one level of it is they want to create a situation of inter-race, inter-culture um, wars in Europe. And when you've got the head of the French police before Nice saying um, that France is on the brink of civil war, well, you can see how they're moving it on. And if, if people want to, uh, want to see where this is meant to lead in terms of uh, the scale of imposition by the state upon basic freedoms and what is called democracy and uh, free speech, then they should look at what is happening now in Turkey, because um, this quote coup in uh, Turkey, uh, on the face of it, there was an attempt to remove the regime of the president Erdogan. And that may well be true, but there's another way of questioning this too. And that's the incredible speed in which the Erdogan regime responded to it. Um, clearly knowing it was all coming, and how they have since set about um, arresting um, thousands of judges and academics and teachers and others um, who were not supporters, basically, of the Erdogan regime. And how on earth can you justify arresting that number of people so soon after this, quote, military coup attempt, where does the evidence come from in that short time to justify this, this massive number of arrests of people in the country? It doesn't. It was all pre-planned quite blatantly. Um, 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 as a result of this, this vacuous, vicious, um, insane man, Erdogan, who serves the interests of the West, not least by supporting uh, uh, ISIS in Syria. Um, he's been uh, given the opportunity, problem, reaction, solution, to purge um, all the people he thinks are against him. Because Turkey's no longer a democracy. It's a tyranny. It's a dictatorship. And it's being justified by Erdogan on finding a solution to the problem of the coup attempt. And in all these events, this is the reason why, you know, if you read the alternative media as it dissects these official narratives of these terrorist attacks and shootings, why so many questions immediately start to arise? Um, why the official narrative has so often holes in it all over the place and contradictions in it all over the place? And um, why you see these patterns of repeating behavior, repeating patterns of action from one to the other? And when you, when you see them all and you see the recurring patterns, it's quite clearly that these um, attacks, most of them anyway, are being played out to a 
blueprint, a repeating blueprint. Now, is that a coincidence? Of course not. Why do um, we see over and over again people that commit um, shootings and other attacks in the United States being connected to the FBI? Even the mainstream media in America here and there has pointed this pattern out. We are being subjected to a colossal mind game. Because it is, it is a mind game because it has to be a mind game. When there's a few of you and you want to impose your will on the many, you can't impose it on seven uh, plus billion people physically. There's too many of them and there's not enough of you. So what you have to do is you have to recruit from the target population and put them in uniform to impose your will on the target population, which is, of course, what happens, why so many psychopathic people are recruited into law enforcement. That's not to say they're all psychopaths, of course not. But um, there is no doubt a pattern of recruiting psychopaths into these positions who will carry out um, what you tell them without question and enjoy it. This is why there's so many outrageous things happen, like um, police officers shooting innocent people for no reason. And so, if you don't have the numbers to physically impose your will upon everyone, then what you have to do is impose your will psychologically by getting the target population to think and perceive the world and self in ways that suit your agenda, which will get them to not only accept what you want to impose upon them, but demand it. Save me, protect us, this can't go on. And this mind game, which has been um, unfolding all this period um, through the uh, 20th, 20th century, the present century and beyond, is now being ramped up like never before. And one of the reasons for that is that, as I know, you know, going around um, Australia in the last few weeks with some more um, events still to go, there is without question an awakening going on of more and more people, including people within the system, to the point where they're seeing the world and what's happening in the world in a different way. They're starting to see the dots connect. They're starting to see that actually maybe this is not happening because of why we're told it's happening. This, this, this is very, very blatant to me. I mean, I've been doing this for 26 years. I've seen the transformation in the numbers of people who are going, whoa, uh, maybe there's another way of looking at this. Never, never before has it been at the, uh, of the scale it is now, and we haven't seen anything yet. Now, this cabal know that this is going on, and they're trying to lock everything down as fast as possible and get this Orwellian in, uh, state in um, as fast as possible. And so we're seeing the, um, the whole thing ramped up in terms of, events unfolding to get people into fear and into giving their power away to be protected from what they've been manipulated to fear. The antidote to this is two things. One, um, que bono, which translates as who benefits. Who benefits from me believing the official version of this event, which, whichever it is? So when these uh, attacks and uh, horrific happenings um, are reported and the official version of what happened and why and who did it is reported, just ask the question every time, who benefits? Who benefits from me believing the official story I'm being given of this situation? And invariably, you will find that the only people who benefit 
are those that want to get people in fear, that want to justify more Orwellian legislation, that want to go in and bomb more innocent people, and want to push the world further along the road to this Orwellian global state of total control. So that is an antidote immediately, every time these things happen and the official narrative is reported. But there's one other, and that's for everyone, whether black, white, Muslim, Jew, Christian, anybody, everybody, to realize that this conspiracy to enslave humanity in this Orwellian global state, which is unfolding so fast now, is why more and more people are seeing it, it's not a conspiracy to enslave Muslims or middle class Americans or black South Africans or Australians. It's a conspiracy to enslave all of us and our children and grandchildren even more so. And we've got to start growing up and realizing that while we allow ourselves to be played off against each other in these divide and rule scenarios without having the streetwise, uh, streetwiseness to ask the right questions when these things happen. Who benefits, for instance? If we go on buying these manufactured fault lines of divide and rule, then this Orwellian global state will happen. But it doesn't have to. If we realize that whatever the color of our skin or the nature of our culture, we are all in this together because we together are that target population. Not one bit, not this bit, not that bit, all of us. And if we, if we do those two things, we come together, we put down the fault lines, we create a simple situation and response called respect. Respect for another's culture, but the other's culture's respect not to try to impose that culture on you and vice versa. To respect someone's religion. I mean, I don't agree with any religion, but if people want to believe a religion, good luck to it. So long as they don't seek to impose it on anyone else. And if we can just find the maturity and the expansion of consciousness enough to live together and respect the differences, indeed celebrate them, then one of the major factors that allows this whole thing to unfold, divide and rule, disappears. And if we can find also the maturity and the expansion of consciousness enough not to accept the official story of Sorry about the noise. The windows are open. Get some air in this place. I should be here every single Anyway, I don't have to. I have been. Ooh, a lovely place, but ooh, warm for me. But if we um, can find that maturity and that expansion of awareness enough to ask questions of every official narrative and see if it stands up, see if it um, goes through that filter uh, of who benefits. If we can do these two things, put down the fault lines, ask the right questions, we will see so clearly, A, what's really going on and what's behind it, and B, we will remove the divide and rule that allows it to go on and go on uh, pushing the world down this dark and dangerous road for freedom, uh, which we've been going along for a long time. And because it's been going along a long time, now we're starting to see very clearly uh, not just the uh, bits and pieces being removed, but basic, basic freedoms now.
being removed uh, in a way that more and more people are finding hard to ignore and just look the other way and hope it isn't true. It is true. And um, we need to come together. It may sound trite, it may sound simple, but if we don't come together, if we go on being apart and played off against each other, we go on not asking the right questions when these events happen because, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist, then goodbye freedom. Not for one faction, not for one community, for everyone. Come on. Time to grow up. And time to get a grip of this. Progressives should, um, if they are what they claim to be, should be supporting that struggle of uh, the mass of the people against the control by a privileged elite. Instead, those that call themselves um, progressives have become supporters of that elite, expressions of that elite, and demonizers of those who are challenging it. The progressives have become the new authority, the new big brother, the new censors. And this 2016 has been, as you know, so many commentators are saying, an absolutely extraordinary period, uh, a watershed in global politics, particularly in the West. We've had um, these supporters of this constantly centralization of, of global power called globalization this um, more and more power of the few over the many the supporters of this uh, like hillary clinton um gone we have people like matteo renzi um kicked out after a referendum in italy we have um francois Hollande uh, in france gone not officially gone yet, but not standing, finished once his term's over. And um, we've had um, Angela Merkel, uh, again, classic um, promoter and uh, supporter of this elite agenda, now hanging on by her fingertips as a result of her open door policy for migrants in Germany with the consequences that have come from that. So it's been, uh, add Brexit to all this and other things that have happened in Europe in terms of uh, support for so-called populist um, groupings. And it's been an extraordinary uh, year in which the, the people have started to stir, to wake up to what's going on and my God, so far, it's just a fraction of what's going on, but it's a start. And, and to say, we're not having it anymore. Now, what we need in 2017 is for that to kick on. And what I mean by that is to move beyond the idea that the political system, i.e. voting for Trump or voting for this or voting for that, is actually going to change anything. The political system worldwide is so stitched up in terms of who gets to power and uh, multiple parties, usually two in any country, um, actually being masks on the same face, i.e. whichever one gets in, the same agenda uh, kicks on. It's to wake up to that and to realise that um, voting for people to put them in political power, as the system works currently, is, is just basically moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. And this is the next stage we need to go to, where if we're gonna change things, we don't hand that power of change to politicians, whoever they may be, but we do it ourselves. We come together, we put down the fault lines that are there just to divide and rule us, of race, of income bracket, of, of, of um, uh, culture and we realize we're all in this together and we need to work together to bring this to an end otherwise we'll be divided and ruled and it will all go on now 
the so-called uh, progressives, I've had a big wake-up call, unfortunately they ne never took it, in terms of Barack Obama. He was the man, the political leader, he was going to come in and change everything. It's never, never going to happen. Just another a, a puppet for the puppeteers in the shadows. And of course, the policies went on. They just followed on after Bush and away you go. And they couldn't see it. And another big thing happened. As a result of investing all that um, hope uh, into Obama and their people's reputations, or oh, this guy's different, they've allowed him to, to go on basically following the same policies, not least in the Middle East, of um, boy George Bush. But instead of the great um, resistance that Bush got from an, a, 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 a large anti-war movement, none of it, basically, under Obama. Just had this free ride from people who should have been challenging it. And I'm starting to see the same things happening with Trump. Donald Trump is the, um, the big hope of um, so many people in America who, well, they don't think, they know that the system run by the elite has just abandoned them, doesn't care about them, just leaves them to somehow survive. And so Trump comes along, what do political leaders do? When they're trying to get elected, they'll tell you what you want to hear. What, what their natural constituency of support and potential constituency of support wants to hear. And then what do politicians do when they get in? They do as they bloody like and we're always going to do before. And we're seeing this with Trump. Trump, the idea that Trump was going to uh, drain the swamp. Ludicrous. And so many people in the so-called alternative media fell for it and still falling for it because... Even though we look at Trump's picks for uh, his government and we see that far from draining the swamp, he's just filling it. So many of those in the alternative media that supported Trump, which is not what the alternative media should be doing, it should be challenging the system, not supporting a, a, a puppet of it. Anyway, um, they are keeping strong or making um, excuses for him, just as the progressives made excuses for Obama when he went down another road to the one he said he would. So we now have um, Donald Trump uh, handing over control of the American economy to Goldman Sachs in the form of um, uh, Steve uh, Mnuchin, long-time Goldman Sachs man, he's now Treasury Secretary, and the president of Goldman Sachs, Gary called uh, Gary Cohn, um, is going to head the National Economic Council. So Trump, classically, as I've just said, was laying in to the elite during the election campaign, laying in to Goldman Sachs, and then appoints their men to run his economic policy. Do you think that will be for the people? Do you think that will be populist? And then we've got um, Wilbur Ross, Commerce Secretary, another billionaire, the whole government's filled with billionaires. Um, Wilbur Ross, 24 years working for the Rothschilds. We have a um, a multi-millionaire Labour secretary who, who opposes things like the minimum wage. Uh, so the idea that Donald Trump is anti-establishment, is not part of the system, as I said right through the election campaign, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and what was good about the rejection of Hillary Clinton and um, the support for Donald Trump was not because of what Donald Trump is. He, he's not. We're seeing it now. Um, it's because of what people thought he was and what he represented. That That is the indicator 
of where people are at in terms of their their view of the world and that's encouraging that people are now starting to say we're not having this anymore uh, now um, if he sticks to it uh, there might be some good things uh, that Donald Trump um, will do if he sticks to it I mean this is president two mouths it, uh, you know says one thing uh, then says another then does a third but if he um, rejects the hoax of global warming which is only there as a justification to transform human society in the way I explain in detail in the books and the world tour then that would be a good thing and if he um, gets uh, better relations with Russia that will be a good thing because if Clinton had got in um, war with Russia would have been virtually a gimme however even on that we've got to be um, very careful about um, assuming because the elephant in Trump's probably vast living room is that Trump is Israel's man right wrong and anything in between this um, president is going to be the most pro-Israeli president that I, I can think of um, certainly in modern times um, and recent times anything that Israel want basically Trump is going to give them and one of the things that they want is the destruction of Iran some um, leaked emails um, sent by the uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell revealed that Israel has hundreds of nuclear missiles aimed at Iran and of course we have had this militarization by Trump of what should be civilian posts i.e. Uh, defense secretary this uh, guy this military man uh, they call mad dog Mattis mm, someone with a personality that prompts the nickname mad dog yes that's just who we want running the Pentagon and of course we've um, heard from Mattis over the years um, how much he enjoys killing people it's fun yeah just the man you want running the US military and then we've got this guy um, Flynn Michael Flynn as national um, uh, security advisor um, and another military man and they have um, a common view which is that they can't stand Iran here we go and um, they see it as uh, the biggest danger well at the moment Iran and Russia and China are working as one alliance not least in Syria and um, if you go for Iran then you're going to bring in China and you're going to bring in Russia unless and I'm sure this is the, the part of the plan they can somehow by pulling Russia into the fold oh we're bosom buddies now they can they can break that um, alliance with China uh, and uh, so just because he's talking Trump about uh, getting better relations with Russia does not mean that he's a man of peace I mean as I've said China's been a target for a very long time and he's not even in office before he's kicking off um, uh, problems with China and also mentioning Iran in um, very unfavorable terms you can see where the whole thing's going so this um, whole deal with uh, Trump as uh, Israel's man is 
fundamentally important to appreciate in terms of where this Trump presidency is going to go. I mean, God help the Palestinians now. He has appointed a um, extreme, extreme Zionist zealot uh, as his ambassador to Israel, an extreme um, Zionist zealot as his um, international negotiator on many, many things, including the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict and situation. And they're not going to make any decisions to the benefit in any way, shape or form of the Palestinians. They will do what another extreme Zionist zealot, Benjamin Netanyahu, wants them to do. And Israel, i.e. the Rothschilds that created it, have an agenda for the world. And now they have the, the vehicle in the White House or Trump Tower or wherever he sticks himself to push that on. You'll note how much more belligerent uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli regime have become since Trump won because they know their man is in power or soon to be so. And we have Trump uh, saying that the American embassy is going to be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That is, that is extraordinarily um, uh, provocative in terms of, of, of Arab countries and the Palestinians. And that he will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Ditto. And so when you look at the Trump appointments, we have the American economy now taken over by uh, Zionists from Goldman Sachs and um, Rothschild employees. Uh, and we have in the Pentagon and as National Security Advisor, two people who are vehemently opposed to Iran, uh, which Israel want to uh, target. And those that follow things uh, closely will know that when the um, totally extreme Zionist controlled organization called the Project for the New American Century published their list of countries in September 2000 that they wanted to regime change. And of course the people that wrote that document then came to power with Boy Bush and started picking off those um, regimes in that list. Iraq, um, Libya, Syria, also on that list was Iran. So that is very likely to be a, a key word in um, the Trump administration, Iran, and all that um, comes from that. We, um, we need in 2017 to start to move our perceptions of everything, I would suggest, beyond the political system to that which is behind the political system, which dictates to whichever leaders in power, whatever color rosette they may wear, whatever name they may call themselves, and realize that there is an agenda beyond politics, which the whole political system is just there to, to, to camouflage in so many ways, that works through politics, through banking, through um, the corporations, through big biotech, through big oil, through big pharmaceutical, all these things. And they're working out and playing uh, to a global agenda, uh, which I've been ex exposing all these years. And again and again, what was in my books 20 years ago uh, is, is being read on the television news. Why? Because there is an agenda. And if you can access that, then you can, you can um, 
quite comfortably predict it in theme and often in detail where the world's going to go because unless there is an intervention into that agenda to stop it unfolding then it will unfold and you can predict the future the whole point of of, of what i do is to alert enough people that this is what's happening so there is an intervention and this is why i say um 2016 um could well be the end of the beginning the beginning um being the initial perception that hold on a second the world's not run by those we think it is and um the vast majority are having their lives dictated by a ridiculously few people 2016 has also seen say a realignment um a reevaluation of what is called the alternative media because um for me alternative media is about exposing what people wouldn't normally hear and normally see and know about and, and exposing this system of hidden control uh, that people wouldn't normally see. Why? Because they're not supposed to see it. But we have had in 2016 a significant part of the alternative media supporting Donald Trump and actually becoming little more than uh, a public relations uh, promotion operation for Donald Trump who not only won't drain the swamp he's in it and um, I think that's uh, I think that's deeply sad and, and when you um, reach the point of a few days ago where I saw an article on some alternative uh, sites written by an apparently an alternative uh, journalist that was listing all the disasters that have happened in America after uh, decisions had been made that were perceived not to be good for Israel. The, um, the whole thrust being that God uh, deals his wrath upon those that don't do what Israel wants. When you see that coming from an apparently alternative journalist and put out on some alternative sites, then um, you know that there is a re-evaluation necessary in the alternative media about what is alternative and what's just not even mainstream light, just mainstream. And it's this part of the alternative media that won't get pulled in to the game that they desperately, desperately want rid of. And that's where the whole fake news thing has come from. And what you're going to see in 2017 is more and more extreme um, efforts and extreme decisions and impositions to block the circulation of um, information challenging the mainstream narrative, may, may, be it the mainstream media or mainstream politics. Because what, if you like, the populism of 2016 has shown is the power of information when it's put before people. And this is why when you're involved in a perception deception, which is what all this is, you must control the information that people receive. So their perception of everything is the perception you want it to be. And this alternative media in all its forms has um, circulated information, has circulated other ways of looking at the world to the extent where it is impacting 
upon the world through the changing perceptions of people and how they see the way things operate. And it's sad to me that significant parts of the alternative media, not least in America for obvious reasons, have got caught in being lassoed back into the system by supporting a particular candidate on the basis of something he's not. Um, so what the genuine alternative media needs is, um, is support from as many people as possible uh, in the face of this gathering, and it will gather further censorship. And beyond that, let's move to the next stage of this awakening to the world, which goes beyond politics and uh, believing that's the way to change anything. It's there to, to make sure nothing for the better can be changed. And start to realize that we, 7.4 billion people, have the power. We have that power dissipated and diluted by being played off against each other down the fault lines of religion and race and income bracket culture. And we have that unity fractured, that potential unity fractured by people getting pulled into the belief systems that the system wants us to believe in, like politics can change anything, vote for this party and it will be better than this party. Um, because we need to stand up together now and um, stop acquiescing to this edifice of tyranny, this global control system. Because if we leave it where we are now, then it won't really change anything. But if we kick it on and say, OK, not only are we voting for Brexit because we don't want bureaucrats to control our lives, not only are we voting for Trump under the illusory perception that he's anti-system, but we, we people are going to stop cooperating with the system that's controlling us because it can only control us with our cooperation. That's why divide and rule is so important. Get us fighting among each other so we don't in unity say we're not having this anymore. Because one clear fact of history is this. If we will take it, they will give it to us. Let 2017 move us on to the next stage where we take control of our lives, not through some politician, but directly by coming together and refusing to cooperate with that that wishes to enslave us. Do that and a year from now we'll be a lot more free than we are now today. Just a choice. 7.4 million, a uh, billion rather, handful, controlling comparatively. I think I see a way out of this and it's time to take it. I've been saying um, uh, over the years that 2016, 2017, 2018 are going to be crucial years in deciding which direction this world, this human society actually takes. And when you look at the information that I will present over nine hours uh, at each of these events, and how it connects the dots between a fantastic diff uh, number of subjects that uh, on the face of it wouldn't connect, but do fundamentally. When you see that put together and then you play that across current world events, then the suggestion that 2016, 2017, 2018 are crucial years for the future of where this world is going becomes 
crystal clear. I've been um, exposing now since 1991 the hidden hand network that controls all aspects of human society from the unseen controls governments banks corporations the mainstream media giants and so on and it's not doing that for fun it's not doing that for a bit of a laugh it's doing that to achieve a specific end that it has worked towards for a fantastic amount of time it's not something that was decided five years ago 50 years ago 100 years ago it goes way back and there are reasons for this and the goal all along has been to create a global Orwellian centralized dictatorship dictating to and controlling the lives in detail of every man woman and child on the planet it involves creating wars specifically to transform the target area of the war you invade Libya you invade Syria you invade Iraq you transform the nature of that society you create a world war you change the nature of global society and as I've been um, saying writing for a long time the plan of this hidden hand is to create a third world war involving the West against Russia and China to create such catastrophe that people are then open to the solutions that follow which are the very world that this hidden hand has been working towards from the start and the reason the talks take all day and involve something like 2000 images illustrations is because there's so many dots to connect and they include this is something I focus on in the talks a great deal in the books they include the nature of reality itself who are we what is this reality and more to the point connecting into the hidden hand why is that knowledge systematically kept from us by control of mainstream science and mainstream media it's because we are not who we think we are that which we give a name a life history a family history a racial history a cultural history too is merely an experience which the true I the infinite I the eternal I pure awareness is experiencing in this reality a reality which in terms of that which we think we see is a tiny tiny almost laughable range of frequencies that we call visible light everything else beyond that is denied us because we cannot decode the frequencies outside of that one which we call the world there's a reason a massive fundamental reason why that knowledge is kept from us because for the few and and it is a few compared with the global population to control all these billions 
those billions have to be kept in ignorance of their true nature, their true self, and their true power to dictate their own reality and their own experience. So what I do in the talks is bring all these uh, elements together and show that they all fit into a coherent whole, a coherent story, which explains the world that otherwise seems so random, so bewildering. And obviously, as I go into different countries, I bring in aspects of that country into the presentation. But what is so compelling and so fundamentally significant is that although the detail here and there may change, in all the basic themes, everything in the talk and the presentation applies to every single country, no matter what its history, no matter what its culture, no matter what its background. And like I say, these next few years, including this one, are so vital to heading off what is planned. And what is planned is beyond even the comprehension of most people who haven't looked into this information. It is so fantastic. It is so far from what people in general think is happening and where they think we're heading. It's time for humanity to come together and sort this nonsense out and stop the tiny few controlling, dictating to, making suffer the vast majority. But to do that, first, we need to know what's going on. At the end of these all day events all around the world, people there will know what's going on. Sean Adel was increasingly neglecting davidike.com to the point where until I got a new web team in very recently who are doing a fantastic job and, and turning it around uh, very quickly. But until that point, davidike.com and David Ike Books uh, were heading towards a situation where they were going to cease to exist in the not too distant future. And all the work that I've done, all the effort, all the abuse, all the ridicule of the last 25 years, quarter of a century, was going to in effect come to an end. And that contribution to TPV by paying the director's salary while getting increasingly nothing back for it was only part of the contribution. When in the run up for TPV going on air in November um, 2013, I asked for monthly donations of a pound, two pound, three pounds uh, to, to, to meet running costs. I knew, I must be mad, well they say I am, I knew where the vast majority of those monthly donations to TPV would come from. They would come from people moving their uh, subscriptions to davidike.com over to TPV. And that is exactly what happened. I mean, I knew it would, but I did it anyway to try to make TPV work. Not for me, you know, I've always said that I would uh, work full time uh, for it until March, 2014. And then I had to get off on with my, my work, my own work. It was done to give a platform for information and to give a platform to, to other people. 
So davidike.com, uh, David Icke Books, provided enormous, the biggest uh, contributions to TPV in adults' wages and in money that um, was lost to davidike.com to the point because davidike.com has, has such a um, massive traffic that the cost of running it is enormous and therefore uh, the loss of, of, of that money was um, one of the contributing factors to davidike.com um, facing the end in the face um, until we now turned it around very quickly with decent people involved. Then I heard by accident, relatively recently, that Sean Adel was running the TPV website off the davidike.com servers, and thus davidike.com was paying for that as well. And then I moved to London, to Wembley, for six, seven months, staying in uh, Richie Allen's spare bedroom and meeting the uh, living costs of two places. Again, that ran to an enormous uh, uh, figure over the period of time with everything thrown in. Now, put all that together and you are looking at a very, very large sum of money that went from here to the people's voice. And when people who donated are saying, um, what's happening and what's this, what's that? Well, as the biggest single donator, I'm with you. I want uh, to know these things uh, too. But let me um, let me give you some background um, because there are people like um, a brief presenter called Sonia Poulton who are seeking to use TPV to destroy me and my work. I'll get, I'll get to that as we go along. The irony is that she did take money in wages from TPV at the time she was there. And she's attacking someone who, as I've just explained, not only donated all that money uh, by various means, but in all the time that I was there paying my own expenses, living in Richie's spare room, I never took a cent from TPV. I was the only full-time person there who did not receive a cent, the only one. And the irony is, in this inverted, insane world, that having done all that, you end up get <laughs> you end up getting painted the villain. Un frickin believable. But having observed the world for 25 years and noted its extreme level of madness, maybe it's not um, unbelievable. So let me give you some background to TPV and how we got to where we are, as much as I know about where we are now. I had the idea in, I think it was May 2013, to try to create a media platform that would allow suppressed information across the range of subjects to be communicated 24 hours a day. So it wasn't just covering Europe and Britain, it was covering the United States and the, and the entire world. And I did this after reaching a point of 
we're giving up really on ever getting this information out through the mainstream media so the idea was well let's create our own then and like i said earlier the from my point of view the idea was for me to help get it started and then in uh, march 2014 go back to uh, my own work because i'm preparing for the wembley event and that's 10 hours of information and my goodness me it takes a long time to do you, you can't do other things all the time and, and, and pull that in as well. And the last thing I wanted to do was to um, spend the rest of my life involved in a media organisation. You know, I work alone, that's what I do. And my goodness me, I, I, I will from now on, I'll tell you after my experience, which I'll get to. My uh, role in TPV has been content. It was from the start. And I can tell you, um, when you have a blank sheet of paper, as I started out with, and 24 hours a day of programming, seven days a week ongoing to fill it with, then that's a massive task in itself. Sean Adel ran the, if you like, the business side of things. And with, with others who came in and were employed. And I was a director of TPV with him for a short time and then stood down. Um, and, I, you know, what's happening, and I, I'll get to this, but what's been happening with TPV is, is people um, with great malevolent intent have been machine gunning allegations in all directions um, and know, knowing that for some people, naive people that they they would they would they would stick and they'd be oh no there must be something well it was like oh why has he stepped down as a director well here's why we did not intend from the start to come under the regulator in britain the media regulator called ofcom because we were an internet station and thus it's a very uh, a grey area, um, st it still is, about whether Ofcom has regulation over internet um, stations, but it's claiming it does. And um, it was an organisation created by Tony Blair, so, you know, that's how, that's how bad it is. And <laughs> there was a guy who came, his name was Welsh. Um, and he went off on one. He was a volunteer. Uh, he was asking for some expenses to do this or something. I don't really recall it. I wasn't involved in it, but that's what I'm told. Anyway, he, 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 he threw his dummy out the pram and off he went and, and then has been trying to damage the station ever since. I think from the moment he got home, really. Anyway, um, it seems that uh, he and others um, actually contacted Ofcom and said what about this this TPV they shouldn't be doing this without your regulation and then when Ofcom as a result of all that uh, contacted us uh, we had to come under um, Ofcom regulations otherwise we would not have gone on air they would have stopped that and given that people had donated that was not going to be an option not going on air um, and then the same bloke and, who kind of said to Ofcom, what about this, then, then criticised us for coming under Ofcom regulations. So I tell that little cameo story because that is the extraordinary mentality of those who have worked so hard to bring TPV to an end. And if it, it only give a fraction of that to making the world a nicer place, and a freer place, then we might actually get somewhere, but that's not um, where they're coming from. Now, as a result of coming under Ofcom regulations, one of them is that a director of a media company cannot appear on air and be a, 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 a you know a, a regular contributor. And as the whole idea of the People's Voice was to um, put out suppressed information 
Uh, for me, after a quarter of a century of researching it, to be barred from actually appearing on the station was ridiculous. So I stepped down so that I could appear um, on the station. There's also been a question, uh, which I completely understand, of why the People's Voice was set up as a private limited company. Well, this is the reason. The idea from the start was to um, create a non-profit foundational trust and accountants were asked to set that up. However, what happened is they came back to us and said, well, we can set it up, but the rules say that if you are a, a, a non-profit making trust or um, foundation that is receiving the tax benefits of that, then um, you can't be political. And if you can't be uh, political in the widest sense, there was no point in TPV's existence. So we were left with the worst of all worlds. That was a, a company that was private limited, which is the only way we could be political, the accountants told us, and had none of the tax benefits of being non-profit, even though we were non-profit. And the business rates at um, the Wembley location alone was something like 32,000, maybe a bit more, um, a year. Um, and being a non-profit foundation would have, would have, would have saved us that. Um, so no one wanted to be that more than, more than, more than me. And so we started putting the people's voice together and it was a fantastic achievement because of the donations in the um, summer of 2013. We, one, needed to get on air quickly to justify that, and B, all the time we weren't on air, the potential for, for, for uh, raising money and advertising and sponsorship for running costs um, was being lost. So we, we had no choice to but get on air as quick as possible. And the, um, the achievement was fantastic to take a battered uh, room or two rooms um, and turn that into a television studio and, and newsroom and, and, and a production site for um, a, a list, a long list of self-created uh, productions, including the, the band, which gave uh, musicians and comedians a, 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 a stage to be seen who most of them w wouldn't get that stage otherwise and I know that it's benefited their careers of a number of them greatly um, and we were doing all this and were achieving um, what we set out to achieve and the running costs to achieve that were were massive. I mean, when you take into account that the system, the computer system that played the programs out and without which we couldn't have done what we did because you know, uh, you can't do an operation like we were doing 24 hours a day of programming and not have it or much of it automated, the non live stuff. That plus turning a battered room into a television studio and then all the equipment that, that, that went with it. I mean, there you're talking, um, from what I saw, you're, you're talking up in the 80, 90,000 pounds, just for that, for anything else. And when we went on air in um, November, 2013, I think it was the 25th, um, the monthly running costs for wages of full-time people but not me. Um, the cost of um, rent, the cost of 
business rates, the cost of, 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 of power, the, the cost of um, uh, all the um, uh, streaming of, of the programming 24 hours a day. That uh, was running at £50,000 um, a month. And clearly, you couldn't go on like that unless you brought in advertising and um, sponsorship. And without that, nothing was going to um, keep TPV on air for that long. I'm amazed it actually got as far as it did in, into, um, into July 2014. But the crucial thing was we needed sponsorship and we needed um, advertising. And the situation was that the crucial time in the in the life of TPV that was going to decide if it was going to go forward or it wasn't was the period immediately after we went on air from <clears throat> November, December, January, February uh, in, in 2014. And TPV has not made it because that advertising and sponsorship was not forthcoming. And therefore, every month to keep the station going, more money was going out than was coming in, and that can only end one way. And that's why um, we had to take the live programming down, Richie Allen's show, uh, because the live programming was the most expensive. You need producers, you need uh, people that are going to run the show uh, and they're working full time. So that had to go. And eventually this process of more money going out than coming in, like I say, was gonna, only going to end one way. So why didn't we get the advertising and sponsorship? Well, two main reasons, especially in that crucial time I spoke about. One is the information we were putting out. When you are challenging a system that serves companies and businesses that have the kind of money that can make substantial uh, contributions to advertising and sponsorship, when you're challenging the system on which they prosper, well, they're not really keen on sponsoring you um, and giving you advertising and supporting you. And so we were left with um, small alternative companies, overwhelmingly, that don't have big advertising, advertising budgets and do not have the money to make major donations and sponsorship. But there was another reason and I want to come to that. At that crucial time across New Year, 2013-2014, a campaign of unbelievable malevolence, mendacity and vitriol was unleashed against TPV and people who work there. And this is how it came about. Sonia Poulton became a presenter of one of the programmes on TPV. She's a freelance journalist who's worked in the mainstream media. And she didn't come full time until what well, couldn't be much more than 10 days or so before we went on air in November 2013. And she was all smiles and um, all that stuff up to that point. 
and uh, for a little while after the start. But then, not just me, but many other people started to notice um, a pattern. And it was one of producers on her programme uh, leaving, uh, staff being upset at the way they were treated uh, by her. And it became um, more uh, divisive when we did a telethon just before we went on air. This was, and because that she was um, not working full time but was doing her other work, um, she was not asked to present it. Richie Allen, who was working full time, presented it for obvious reasons. Now. Um, Sonia Porton then refused to appear on that telethon, making some excuse about one of the guests, uh, Peter Tatchell, shouldn't have been on the show. But, you know, anyone with a, a brain looking on saw that she was miffed about not being um, the presenter. And then um, it became more and more divisive and more and more an unpleasant place to work. Uh, when you have a situation, for instance, where the presenter of a, a, a program is telling her team to have nothing to do with the team of another presenter's program because they didn't like him. When you have people, presenters, complaining that I am doing a paper review every day on another person's program and therefore that program would get a bit, bigger audience than theirs, then you start to see that you, you are not dealing with someone who is putting the information and the ethos of the station first. There is another agenda. Anyway, it carried on and people were trying to, you know, keep things going and you know let, keep the, the conflict as less as possible although the the atmosphere w was horrible i mean there there were some very very nice genuine people that um worked at tpv but i gotta tell you um i have never come across personally more poisonous self-obsessed mendacious manipulating people than I came across in one place um, at uh, the People's Voice. Anyway, things came to a head when we had um, another telethon at uh, 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 New Year, last New Year. And it was um, five hours, as I recall. And the first two and a half hours was um, Richie Allen. And the second two and a half hours was presented by Sonia Poulton. The first two and a half hours of, 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 of Richie's contribution was, was bright, it was quick, it was interesting, and it was, um, it was very, very positive, very up, you know, upbeat. But then um, Sonia Poulton came on, and um, from, from my point of view and the point of view of, of people who were, were running the station, uh, the 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 show became akin to watching paint dry. It was just four people just in, you know, talking and talking and talking and talking, and that that wasn't what the telephone was supposed to be about. There's nothing wrong with that if you're discussing things, but that wasn't the telephone was about. And you know, it um, it got to the point where you know, how long is this going to go on? So it was then decided, um, and the producer decided that there was a, um, some moving pictures, a report that Sonia Poulton had done um, that was supposed to go into, into that uh, show at one point. So the decision was made, look, you know, we can't go on and on and on like this interminably. So let's pull the, um, the moving pictures report up and, and play that earlier. Well, um, Sonia Poulton, <clears throat> shall we say, um, was not having it and screamed at the 
producer and the head of production and inform them that if anything was changed she was walking out in the middle of a live show when we're trying to raise money to keep the station going and clearly that level of diva another opinion of history another view of history I mean just ponder on that you have a different version of history so so it's a criminal offence. Think about it. We accept these things. I question them. That makes you anti-Semitic, apparently. In their fevered minds. Uh, but this is the best one. This Rathji person. Uh, quote, um, Rathji also argued that the reptilian theory is no more than a dog whistle for the anti-Semitic. Really? People, he said, know how to decode the code about the reptilians. So when I'm writing books decade after decade about um, a non-human force in other dimensions of reality that take a reptilian form that are manipulating human society from what is to humans unseen, which is almost the entirety of existence. And when I'm talking about um, uh, ancient accounts of this, modern accounts of this, uh, when I'm um, dealing literally quite demonstrably, literally, in terms of um, non-human reptilian entities. Somehow, that is code for Jewish people. Evidence? Zilch. They don't need evidence. All you do is ring up venues, bombard them with uh, lies, innuendo, and then they pull the event. It's ever so simple. People think free speech, or oh, it's a pillar of free society. No, it's not. Gone like that. It's going like that every day. Um, people um, know how to decode the code about reptilians. Really? Well, they don't, because it's literal I'm talking whether Ike means it or not, that doesn't change that fact. So whether I am really meaning reptilians or whether I'm using it as a code doesn't matter. It's still a code. It seems uh, ridiculous, this uh, Raji uh, says, but the conclusion that Ike draws, wait for this one. This is a, this is, this is a, a, he never said that. But the conclusion that Ike draws is that because he thinks the reptilians are pulling the strings behind the scenes, therefore the Holocaust didn't happen, that's anti-Semitism. So because I'm saying reptilians are manipulating human society, not only reptilians, many other different expressions of non-human life, uh, then I am, by definition, by saying that, saying the Holocaust didn't happen. Now, it's worth just considering the uh, extraordinary fact that this is the mentality that is seeking to delete the rights of people both to speak their truth and for others to choose to hear it. And unless we start to focus everybody, even those that don't think they're affected by it, because they will be eventually, if we don't start to focus on this speed with which the basic human right of freedom of expression is being deleted, then before most people realize, 
it will not only be uh, affecting them, but there'll be no freedom of expression left. Only the right to have views and express views within the parameters dictated by the state. We're already moving in that direction incessantly. And of course, to control a population en masse, you have to control the way they think, the way they perceive everything, including world events. And so to do that most effectively, you have to control the information they receive from which those perceptions are formed. And so you don't just need a mainstream media banging out 24-7 the version of everything that you want the target population to believe. You also need to block any other information that is challenging that narrative. And thus we have this attack uh, through this fake news label on the alternative media. But it's much deeper and goes much further than that. If you said to most Germans, do you live in a free country? They would probably reply, yes, few reservations, but yeah, really. Well, they don't. For many reasons. One of which is that I've been talking around the world in country after country, literally all over the world, since the summer of 2016 and endless times before that over the years, uh, with no problem. No problem for a very long time. And yet, I cannot speak in Germany. I'm effectively banned from Germany. I can talk in other EU countries, no problem. But Germany? No. Because when we book venues, either the booking is not taken, or, and this has happened many times now, the venue says, yeah, no problem. And then, shortly afterwards, says, actually, there is a problem. And what's happened is uh, a group of people who are so stunningly arrogant that they believe they have the right to control what people hear. Uh, contact the venue, tell them a pack of lies about me and what I'm going to say at the event. All provable lies because I've been talking for months and months and months. People know what I'm going to say. And as a result of relatively minor pressure and extraordinary levels of mendacity, the venues just pull. And the latest effort was to speak in Berlin um, in October. And my son, Jamie, who organizes them, flew out to Berlin, met the venue owners, it's a hotel chain, and contract was agreed and flew back, everything fine. And then we hear, not from the venue, by the way, from um, a media report that it's been pulled. Uh, this is the report. Lizard conspiracist David Icke not wanted in Berlin. Well, before they've got into the text, the, uh, the headline is incredibly misleading because thousands of people 
many thousands of people um, would like to hear what I've got to say in Germany. The ones that don't want me are those that don't want those people to hear what I've got to say. So I'm not wanted in Berlin. No, I'm not wanted by those who believe that they have the right to dictate what people are allowed to say and who is allowed to hear it. Now, in any other circumstances, what I've just said would constitute a tyranny. Some might call it communism, some might call it fascism, whatever name you give to it, it's a tyranny dictating what people can and cannot hear and destroying this basic human right of freedom of speech. And um, the report goes on, uh, the Maritime Hotel in Berlin has confirmed that it does not want to host the live event planned in October 2017 uh, for me. Unfortunately, said a, a, a spokeswoman, at the time of the request, we were not aware that David Icke would participate in the event. We only found out later. Now that provable fact is an absolute lie. Um, this is um, a media pack for um, venues that uh, was sent to these people who didn't know what they were agreeing to. Um, it has uh, my picture on. Um, it has some of my background and the opening words to the text are David Icke. So I can completely understand, therefore, why they had no idea that it was me. It's a joke. Um, and, you know, you have to pinch yourself. Ooh, ouch, yes, it is true. Um, to believe it. So even more outrageous, this hotel chain that's told the media that they're not going to have the event they have agreed to and knew what it was, though saying it, they don't, has not, a week later now, told us the venue is, is not um, going to allow the event to go ahead. And when uh, Jamie tries to contact them to say, look, we've seen this media report, what's going on, and you're quoted in it, they won't take his calls. And this is supposed to be a, a major hotel chain in Germany. What's it called again? Maritim. And that's how they behave. But this gets uh, even more farcical as we go on. Um, this report says the Maritim declined to give a reason for the cancellation. I'll give you a reason. Um, people contacted them, that contacted all these other venues, lied through their teeth about what I was going to say and what I believe. And um, they then said, oh, we're not having that because, you see, standing up for freedom of speech uh, is not something most people are prepared to do. Uh, what they're looking for is how does this affect me instead of how does this affect freedom? And so they pull, number of them have pulled. Uh, they must be in a club, uh, what, what do they call it? The, the, the Jelly Spine Club might be appropriate. Uh, but this article does uh, quote um, another venue who agreed to the event, no problem and then pulled, something called the Carl Benz Arena in Stuttgart, um, who they quote as saying that it held to the values of the German basic law, which also includes the right to free speech. That's how they all start, well, most of them. But then comes the but. There's always a but. Because we believe in freedom of speech, can't be against it, that look very good, does it? We believe in freedom of speech, but. 
And there's a but here. Um, it includes the right to free speech, but, of course, only as long as this conforms to the democratic principles of our society. Anyone that's heard me speak on this worldwide wake-up tour who's listening to this will be now having their jaw somewhere down here and a bewildered look on their face, thinking, how on earth does anything he says go against democratic principles of our society? When indeed, I am calling for more freedom, more, if you like, democracy, because the what democracy is supposed to stand for is being deleted day after day after day. So I'm actually calling for more, if you like, democratic values, but they won't let me speak because of um, not conforming to democratic principles. <laughs> it gets funnier. Stick with me. Um, so um, the, this report goes on. Many critics have noted that Ike uses anti-Semitic arguments and imagery. Name them. Name them. Name that from my talks on this talk. No, they just throw it out. And that's a, a, a line that the media use all the time. Many critics have noted. Oh, really? Who? People with a vested interest, what about the ones who haven't? And then, I mean, this is the next line. Like many racist conspiracy theorists, if you look at a video uh, cast that I did very recently um, about trying to shut me up, um, you'll hear sections from the, the talk where I'm saying, actually, that racism is ridiculous. And um, one of the quotes when I'm talking about the nature of reality that I use is if the nucleus of an atom, which bodies are supposed to be made of, were the size of a peanut, the atom would be about the size of a baseball stadium. If we lost all the dead space inside our atoms, we would each be able to fit into a particle of dust and the entire human race would fit into the volume of a sugar cube. What I'm saying is race is a nonsense. Ah, but as is the physical body, it doesn't actually exist. It's a hologram. Um, but when you're saying race is a nonsense, you are like many racist conspiracy theorists. When you're absolutely obsessed with race and see it everywhere, then you're anti-racist. Anyway, this report then quotes someone called Jan Rathji of this organization, a NGO it's described as, that tracks racism in Germany. Oh, really? We're getting down to what's going on then. Uh, he welcomed the um, cancellation of the German events. Oh, you welcome free speech being deleted, do you? And you welcome um, preventing people that want to hear what I've got to say, hearing what I've got to say. Oh, let's have a round of applause. That's brilliant, that. Just the kind of society we want to live in. Uh, but but what about what about you, Jan? Are you able to say what you want? Oh, of course. And you'll be screaming and squealing at anyone suggesting that you shouldn't. Uh, David Icke, says this person, has a lot of influence on the conspiracy ideological scene. See, drop the ideological in. Um, when actually... It's challenging ideology. <sighs> anyway, especially, uh, says this person, through the anti-Semitism he spreads. Where in these talks am I doing that? 
It's ridiculous. See that other video from about two or three weeks ago. Um, and and the arrogance of this, um, through um, anti-Semitism he spreads, which appeals to people in Germany because it offers some relief from the guilt of German crimes against humanity in the Holocaust. How do you feel about that, people of Germany? Eh? How do you feel about that, anyone that wants to hear what I've got to say? The arrogance of it is truly, truly extraordinary. Well, anyone who studies dictatorships, tyrannies, will know one thing. One of the greatest, indeed, the foundation of tyranny is dividing and ruling the target population. And now look around the world. You've got America divided and ruled over the clashes between Trump supporters and uh, so-called progressives. Uh, you have the um, divide and rule going on in Britain over Brexit. And you have the divide and rule going on across Europe with regard to um, the scale of immigration. Uh, does anyone think this is all an accident? That it's all happening by chance, by random events? When, when you do the research, the same characters keep coming up across all of those things and more that are dividing and ruling the global population and thus allowing the few not just to control but to continually direct the lives in terms of where the world is going of billions of people. So today I'm going to talk about Trump, progressives, Zionist billionaires, fake news and the um, the state of the alternative media and all those things are part of a a coherent whole when you see how the dots connect now um donald trump he was elected not because of what he is and not because of what he'll do, but because of a public perception, at least among a great number of Americans, a public perception of what he is and what he will do. And, um, well, reality is dawning already. He's gone back on prosecuting uh, Hillary Clinton for extraordinary levels of criminal activity and corruption and much more. He's going back on climate change being a hoax. Uh, he's uh, uh, condemned the so-called alt-right uh, media that essentially got him elected and um, he's uh, going back on his Muslim ban and he is apparently going to produce an economic package sits back in amazement can't believe it struggling with the shock that will benefit the very rich and make them very much richer He really has only one um, area left already. I mean, he's not even in office yet where he can produce what he said he would do. And that is not to appoint um, heads of defense and secretary of state from a pool of people apparently being considered that are warmongering, let's go to war with Russia, 
let's continue business as usual in terms of overseas imposition of American will through military means. We, we can only hope that he will be, even him though, it must take some, it must take something, that even him um, will be too embarrassed to appoint those sort of people um, to the Defence Department and the State Department after what he uh, has said about improving relations with Russia and um, not wanting to um, have uh, the regime change of President Assad in uh, Syria as uh, a non-negotiable must be, which is fundamental to bringing an end to that US, UK, NATO members manipulated catastrophe, which is masquerading as a people's revolution in Syria. And um, interesting that uh, Trump uh, has uh, already uh, spoken out against the so-called alt-right. And you know, um, <laughs> will people never learn? What politicians do, and con men and liars, sorry I repeat myself, is they tell they are their electorate that which they have to get to vote for them They're that part of society that will uh, vote for them never mind the ones that won't they have to tell that uh, potential support what it wants to hear and if trump was going to get elected he had to get this increasingly uh, um, vast uh, number of people, massively uh, increasing number of people, who get their um, information overwhelmingly through what's become known as the alternative media. People who are sick of being lied to by the, uh, the mainstream decade after decade after decade. And so what Trump did, he's told them what they wanted to hear. So it was... Um, the climate change hoax, it was uh, um, going for the economic system um, and um, sorting out the Federal Reserve and, and all these things that um, people in the alternative media uh, want to hear. But now, of course, reality is dawning because he's going back on one after the other. And uh, if he goes back, uh, we, we hope he won't. We hope he, he, he will be too embarrassed uh, to do it. But if he goes back on um, his pledges for foreign policy and puts war hawks in the key positions, then um, there is, before he comes to power, there is nothing left, basically, of what he said he would do. And it, it's... A head shaker for me that um, significant um, um, swathes of the so-called alternative media in the United States uh, should be uh, supporting uh, Trump in the belief that he was going to do what they wanted him to do. And of course, all we're seeing is a repeat of what happened with Obama. And, and, and the other side of this ludicrous political uh, so-called spectrum. He came in, he was going to be the great new uh, political messiah of change and transformation. He wasn't going to be like George Bush before him. He wasn't going to uh, be a warmonger. He was going to be about fairness and justice and all these things. And uh, of course, you would take it as a gimme that the first black president would be good for black people in America. Didn't work out so well, did it? The why is simple. Um, he was just the first black frontman president for a hidden hand cabal that 
had uh, used up to this point um, white men, <laughs> front men in the White House. So it was business as usual. But there was a difference, you see, and this is very, very significant in this psychological game that is going on, because it's all, it's all a mind game. Remember during the Bush administration, when he was using the excuse of the um, completely uh, um, internally created 9-11 uh, to justify going into Iraq, etc., um, there was a very strong um, anti-war movement started to build um, in the United States. And it was made up of what people uh, are now calling and call themselves progressives. I'll, I'll get to that later on. Then Obama comes in, the darling, the messiah of the progressives, and continues business as usual. Uh, with what's happened in Libya, for instance, what's happened in uh, Syria, and the extraordinary levels of death and destruction that his um, policies, in league, not least with Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, um, have um, visited upon the uh, so deeply tragic uh, Middle East. Where's been the anti-war movement? in the Obama years. Hmm? Where is it? Nowhere. Why? Because when you put your faith in this Messiah president, this Mr. Progressive president, then uh, well, a number of things happen. First of all, you can't or you don't want to admit to yourself you've been had and thus what you would condemn Bush for, rightly before, you keep your mouth shut in terms of Obama, even though he's doing the same things. And so what we're seeing now is the same, but at the other polarity. We're having um, the so-called um, alt-right and those parts of the alternative media um, that supported Trump um, already... Uh, privately, and even some, to be fair, publicly, aghast at the way he's going back on everything. So fast as well, I mean. Oh. Um, anyway, but some are now already defending him for going back on what he said he would do. Why are they defending him? <laughs> for the same reason that the progressives went quiet and the anti-war movement went quiet once Obama came in, doing the same things that Bush had done. And um, alt-right, this is the this new phrase for the alternative right-wing media, as opposed to the mainstream right-wing media. But, you know, I started out doing what I do now. Basically, before there was an alternative media, there was actually nothing there. The old radio station here and there. And you had to get this information out through books or by tramping around from place to place, talking to next to nobody, because nobody was really interested in those days. It wasn't an alternative media. Um, and... It's worth, and I think it's important now, for the alternative media, or cause itself that, to actually take a breath in the light of current events and just reevaluate what it's there for and, and why it, it, it came into existence in the first place. Because if you... Um, if you identify with a political position, whether it's right or left, whether it's Republican or Democrat, whether it's Labour or Conservative or any, any other these uh, political polarities anywhere in the world, then from where I'm sitting, you are not part 
of the alternative media. You are just mainstream light, if that in some cases now. The alternative media came into existence originally to point out that the whole right, centre, left political paradigm is a gigantic hoax. It's a hoax because in the shadows, all these different apparently uh, um, alternative political uh, persuasions are actually masks on the same face of a force in the shadows. And that's why, whether it's a left uh, government or a right government, essentially the same things happen and the world goes in the same direction. It was to point out that the system is rigged and you will never change anything through the political system because the political system is actually there and structured to stop anything changing for the better of the people, to stop anything changing that stops this incessant direction of the world to, to global fascism from continuing. So there is no such thing as an alt-right, an alternative media um, that calls itself right. Just as there's no such thing as a alternative media that calls itself left or center or progressive or any of it. Because these are all tags and names and labels for basically the same thing in terms of ultimately what's controlling them. And so the alternative media needs to, um, needs to look at itself. The genuine alternative media that is um, exposing the way things work rather than taking political positions within the structure of the way things work. And um, it needs to um, make sure that um, it doesn't get pulled into this uh, political nonsense that significant parts of the alternative media have been pulled into. Then there's this thing coming up now more and more and more in the last few days since the Trump election, and it's called fake news. Well, the ironies are not lost. This is the idea that Trump got elected because of fake news from alternative sources. Um, on the internet, social media and all this stuff. The irony, <laughs> there are many, but one of the major ones is that the mainstream media is pushing this about fake news, as are the politicians, of course, um, when if you want the home of fake news, decade after decade after decade, then just go to the alternative media, uh, sorry, the, the mainstream media. Um, although the alternative is involved in fake news as well as I'll come to in parts of it. If you, um, if you look at the, even the, the leaked emails um, in terms of uh, Clinton uh, and the, um, the way the media was working with her to her benefit and to um, manipulate the perceptions of the population, for that same media now to come out and start saying we must, in effect, start censoring the internet because of fake news. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, but of course, the genuine alternative media has and continues to make a fantastic contribution to the circulation of information and exposure of the system and that which serves the system in all its forms, um, which is making an impact upon the political system and on people's awareness of the world as it really is. And so, of course, they want to label things um, in a way that uh, targets the alternative media. So it's all fake news. No, it's not. Actually, it's the best journalism 
on planet Earth comes from the alternative media. However, as I said, um, with a little, what do they call them, Freudian slips, when I said alternative instead of mainstream, um, that actually was very relevant because it's no good either the alternative media sticking its nose in the air um, and looking down on the mainstream and then having very significant swathes of it operating and acting in the same way the mainstream does. Let's not um, fall into this black and white trap that the mainstream media is fake news, but the alternative media, oh, all of it, oh, no, it's the truth. No, it's not. There's a load of old bollocks comes out through what calls itself the alternative media. We, ha we, ha we, we have um, websites, many websites, that call themselves um, alternative media platforms that blatantly put out fake news that they've made up. You, you have... Um, a situation where you, you, they, they put out a headline designed to make you click on it so that you'll add to their advertising revenue. And when, um, you, um, when you go to the text, having now added to their advertising, the text in absolutely no way justifies the headline. It's called clickbait. That's the alternative. Um, there, there's a, a, a one... Um, website, actually, uh, again, ironically, run by a former webmaster of davidike.com uh, some time ago, um, that not only uh, operates with the, uh, the, the clickbait uh, technique, but actually uses a named writer that doesn't actually exist. And they call themselves alternative. Now, if you want to discredit the genuine alternative media that's making and has made such a fantastic contribution to the population's awareness of what's happening and it's not being told about, then all you do is you pick out the fake news people. You pick out the clickbaiters. You pick out people who are using fake writers. And you say that's the alternative media. It's not, but that's the way propaganda works. So it's important that the genuine alternative media doesn't sit around and just let this go unchallenged, but, but constantly highlights to people where these clickbait sites are, where these um, uh, fake news sites are. Uh, and, and, and the alternative media uh, cleans up its own house and please, those that have supported Trump in the alternative media and taken a political position, please sit down, take a deep breath and have another look at it. It's about the system, exposing the system, exposing the rigged system, which means it doesn't really matter who comes in, in terms of front people, because the system's in control, whoever's there. That's what, that's what we were created to expose. Now, progressives. Progressives. Uh, um, th these are people, it's, 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 it's a word used in America, it's being used in Britain and more widely now. Progressives are those, um, you, you, can, you can pretty much recognise them because they have big hearts all the way down their arm on their sleeve oh, I'm so kind and I'm so good look at me look at what I'm doing I'm such a kind loving person right let's um see one of the the, the words that is put together with progressive almost like um, their interchangeable terms is liberal in fact, um, in, in America, uh, it's conservative or it's liberal. It's Republican or Democrat. So this word liberal is thrown around all the time. In fact, it's thrown around very liberally. Um, so three definitions. Liberal. 
favouring reform, open to new ideas and tolerant of the ideas and behaviour of others not bound by traditional thinking, broad-minded. Well, I mean, that's pretty much the direction I'm coming from. Um, if you want to use the dictionary definition, now progressive, which is supposed to be liberal, but uh, isn't much of it anyway. Progressive, favouring or advocating progress, but who decides what's progress? Change, improvement, who decides what's improvement? And reform, as opposed to wishing to maintain things as they are, especially in political matters. Well, there's nothing in that definition that, that you could call liberal. It's just wanting change, uh, etc. Now, this is interesting. This is the definition of fascism. A tendency toward or actual exercise of strong autocratic or dictatorial control. Now, when I look at the behaviour of so many people that call themselves progressives, it's that last definition that I see. We have um, people, um, uh, well, it's obviously much of it has been uh, generated and coordinated out of the shadows, but we've had these protests against Trump um, that um, he, he, he shouldn't be present, that um, things should happen to, to, to stop that happening. We've had violence on the streets. Uh, these people call themselves progressives. Yet if Clinton had have won in the same way that Trump did, that would have been to these same people. Um, the people have spoken. It's democracy. Instead, we've had these progressives um, holding up um, uh, love uh, Trump's hate banners with fury and hatred on their faces. I mean, anyone got a mirror might be helpful. These people are so self-deluded. They don't see that their behaviour mirrors that which they claim to oppose. And so we, we, we're we having um, these protests and then we're having um, Clinton supporters, progressives, crying and in need of therapy and stuff because, because a, a woman who, who so believes in the rights of women that she takes millions from the royal family of Saudi Arabia, which you may have noticed has a problem with women's rights, that someone who is one of the most deeply, deeply corrupt people ever to appear in American politics, and my God, think of the competition, has not won the presidency of the United States. Ah! Therapy! Instead of looking at what is wrong and what is behind a system called democracy and politics that offers you a disaster or a catastrophe in terms of Clinton or Trump. And look at some of the people, one of the major people that fund these progressive organizations. George Soros, Zionist oligarch billionaire. Who was, who was someone that put tens of millions into the um, vote for Trump campaign? Sheldon Adelson, Zionist oligarch billionaire. Does anyone really think in their terminal naivety that those two people don't ultimately answer to the same? Masters. So why would you have massive funding of progressive movements and ma massive funding supporting someone that progressives um, demonize? Trump. 
for president. We come back to where we started. Divide and rule. George Soros and his Open Society Foundations and all the networks that go out from them um, was majorly involved in triggering the Arab Spring, which was presented by the fake news media as a spontaneous people's revolution in the Arab world. It was just a front to allow um, Western, not least American and British funded, armed, trained rebels, mercenaries to um, start a proxy war by America and the UK and other NATO countries against targets in the Middle East like Gaddafi and Assad. But they said, oh, no, it's a people's revolution. It's just a front for a proxy war, because if you keep invading countries over and over again, um, openly, like in Iraq, then people are going to go, what's going on? So you 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 sell it as a people's revolution. Um, and quite a few months ago now, um, there was something in Washington, D.C. called democracy spring, where progressives um, went to Washington to um, protest about uh, billionaires and their influence in politics, uh, as if their um, poster boy, um, Barack Obama, wasn't funded massively to record-breaking um, degrees at the time by the same people. And another irony, a number of the organizations that took part in Democracy uh, Spring are funded by George Soros, a Zionist oligarch, billionaire, who, who does springs rather well, it seems. What you have is um, people of a certain persuasion say the right. They get their information from the right-wing press and what's become known as the alt-right. And then you get people of a progressive persuasion and they get their information from the left-wing press or the so-called liberal press, or the progressive press. And just as in politics and political parties, left, right, centre, whoops, controlled by the same people. So are the left-wing press and so are the right-wing press. They're just different masks, once again, on the same face. So all these uh, groups within politics, whether it's the right or progressives or centre, they're all getting their information about the world basically from the same sources. And the only literal alternative to that is going to the genuine alternative media that's dismantling the system in people's minds by exposing what it is and not taking a left-right position within the, the system of control. And that's why they're targeting the genuine alternative media now through these fake news, anything but alternative websites and through those who've taken a political position in the Trump election. And... Uh, there's something that's a term that's come to be used more and more now. It's called identity politics. And it's time for all persuasions in the political spectrum and those in the alternative media that are not, in my view, very alternative, to grow up and to stop playing this identity political game that's allowing the few to dictate to the many, incessantly, ongoing. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. 
Um, I'm gay, okay, okay, I, I'm gay, uh, not me, but I'm um, talking about this um, gay identity. Uh, there's lots of gay people who um, uh, are not like this, but there is a, a gay um, uh, mentality that, that looks at politics from a gay perspective. What, what, what about gays? Because their identity is that they're gay. Then you have um, transgender identity politics, which is all under this progressive wing. Um, and then you have um, Jewish, Muslim, Christian identity uh, politics, which says, um, I, um, I'm, I'm this, this is my label, so I'm going to vote from a position that best suits my identity. It's the politics of me, me, me. Identity politics. First of all, that is a godsend to anyone who wants to divide a rule. But it also means that simple things like what is fair, what is just, what is right by all people, just go missing. Questions like that. What is the fair thing to do here? Not what is the best thing to do for my identity and my identity politics. What is the fair thing to do here in this situation? What is the just thing to do in this situation? And there's another part of this identity politics, which is, which is money. What's the, what's the fair thing to do? What's the just thing to do? in terms of the financial system. It's that no one is without a home. No one is hungry. And no one is allowed to fall below a certain basic um, level of, of, of life. But what does identity politics do in terms of the finance? It says, which one will make me more money than I already have and I have more than I could, I could spend in a hundred lifetimes? All this identity stuff, all this me, 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 what's in it for me, what will they do for me, has made us lose perspective of those simple things, those simple foundations of making judgments and introducing changes. What is fair? What is just? For all people concerned. And, you know, when I talk about progressives of the left, there are still some genuine people um, there that do come from that perspective and do value things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Because when we come back to this definition fascism, liberal and progressive, but particularly when we come back to this, this definition of fascism, that's what political correctness is. It's the arrogant belief that you can dictate what people can say, even eventually what they can think, because you're right and therefore anyone who has a different opinion must be wrong. There's no such thing as a different opinion to a progressive of this extreme nature because they're right. Therefore, you've got a different opinion. You must be wrong. And, and because you've got a different opinion and you're wrong, what value is there in allowing you to speak? It's fascism. It's manipulation of the population, the target population, to silence itself. So those manipulating the target population don't have to. And the great drivers of this politically correct fascism, this destruction and deletion of basic freedom of thought, freedom of, uh, of speech and expression, 
the so-called progressives. Oh, I'm so kind. Look at me. All it is, is, is George Orwell's 1984 Newspeak. All those decades ago, he predicted this. And here's the progressives who are actually behind it. They're behind the, the hoax of global warming. So no one can have uh, a, a, another view exposing that. Otherwise, they have to be silenced. And you know, progressives of this kind, and my God, they're growing. Do you know who put Trump in power? Eh? You did. You know who won the Brexit vote that you didn't want uh, to go the way it did? You did. Do you know what's um, driving people into, um, into, into parties that are, 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 are against immigration in Europe uh, of the scale that's happening? You are. And I'll tell you why. Because you are the new establishment, the new authority, you have uh, made it impossible, increasingly impossible anyway, not quite, try it with me, for people to express how they feel. If, if what happened with Trump, it, as I said in a recent video cast, it was a primal scream for help from vast numbers of people who knew Clinton was business as usual, and they just hoped that maybe Trump wasn't. It's a vain hope, but that's where they were coming from. And you know why? Because they have not had a voice. They've not been able to express what's happening to them economically, what's happening to their families, what's happening to their communities. Because you, uh, progressives, won't even let them articulate themselves. Why? Because you don't debate anymore, because you've got nothing to debate with. You're a, you, you, you are vacuous in your, in your um, evidence that you put forward to support what you're imposing on everyone else. Instead of debate, what we have are abuse and slogans you vote for Trump, you are by definition a racist, you're homophobic, you're anti-transgender. What, everybody? If you vote to come out of the uh, fascist, communist, bureaucratic dictatorship called the European Union, you are racist, homophobic, anti-transgender. This is what's gone on. And if, if you're concerned about vast numbers of people coming um, from uh, the Middle East and um, North Africa and changing the nature of your community, uh, you cannot speak out about that. Why? Because you are racist. Oh, and I bet if you're racist, you're also homophobic and anti-transgender. This is the fascist uh, dictatorship of the so-called progressives that has led to where we are now. And you, ironically, are out on the streets protesting about it through organizations funded by George Soros, protesting about what you have created. So I say to the still genuine people of what is called the left, people who are genuinely liberal, you have to, if we're going to change this, take the meaning of what you stand for back from these fascist progressives and dictators who daily serve the very system they say they oppose. I'll say this to the genuine alternative media, and there are many in that, where the best journalism on the planet goes on currently. We need to take back what the alternative media really means and what it was created for. Not 
to take political positions uh, within the system that we're exposing. And certainly not to put out clickbait headlines that add to the advertising revenue and produce stories written by named writers who don't exist. We can't look the other way for that stuff anymore. And perhaps, as the truth dawns about Donald Trump, increasingly fast to his supporters, and even now, I'm sure, former supporters, some of them, we need to go to the next stage of this awakening. You know, Brexit, voting for the perception of what people thought Trump was, is evidence that more and more people are sick and tired of being dictated to by this system of control. But we need to go to the next stage of this awakening and realise that the political system is not the way to do it. Ceasing en masse to cooperate with our own enslavement is the way to do it. Outside the political nonsense and irrelevance in the governments of the world. Because whether you are left or whether you are right, Barack Obama and Donald Trump are not messiahs of change. They are simply different divides. The first thing virtually that I posted immediately after the referendum result in June when 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU, I said that this was just the beginning, that the political class and the financial class, in effect, and the hidden hand behind them, though most of them don't even realise that, were not going to go quietly. They were not going to let uh, Britain leave the EU without a hell of a fight. And so it's proving. But there are there are some good things to this and the events of this week. And that is that it is beginning to dawn on ever more people that there is a conspiracy for the few to control and dictate to the many. I've been pointing this out and providing fine detail for over a quarter of a century, taken endless ridicule and dismissal um, as a result and untold abuse. And so it was nice to read in the Daily Mail today, in a comment uh, column, the following. The truth is that this judgment, which I'll come to shortly to um, throw a spanner in the works of Brexit, plays with fire, fanning the feeling, not just in Britain and Europe, but also among Donald Trump's supporters in America, that Western public life is becoming a conspiracy. The word is being used in the mainstream. I thought they were only theories. Is becoming a conspiracy of tightly knit self-serving establishment elites against the public. Well, the, the only thing wrong with that is it's not becoming. It always has been. The fact is that it's now becoming so blatant that it's becoming more and more obvious to everyone. Well, everyone with a brain on active duty. And... What that judgment is referring to there is a legal challenge this week to the British government's right to trigger something called Article 50 to start the process of withdrawing 
Britain legally from the um, the the web of deceit, mendacity, and manipulation that we call the European Union. Seventeen point four million people voted to leave the EU in June. That is the biggest vote for a political party or a proposition in British history. And the British Parliament voted to have that referendum by a margin of six to one. Why? Because although there is a a very significant majority of people in Parliament, in both the House of Commons, the elected and the unelected House of Lords, um, in favour of staying in the EU, they pretty much uh, convinced themselves that having a referendum would not be a problem because, of course, the, the great unwashed would just vote to stay in. Well, we didn't. And that provided this massive shock to the political establishment. Now, having given the public a referendum to decide whether to stay in the EU, and then um, having them vote um, in such massive numbers uh, to come out, it is simply the government's job now to do the will of the people and to trigger Article 50 and start the process, apparently it's going to take about two years, um, to get Britain out of the stranglehold of the EU, to take back uh, power to make our own laws, to um, not be dictated to by unelected dark suit bureaucrats in Brussels that no one's ever heard of. But like I say, it was never going to be easy because the political class um, that thinks it's um, all-knowing, when it is deeply ignorant, those who are not among the few who are knowingly manipulating um, events, they are um, awash with ignorance, with uh, mendacity, and with the arrogance that they know best, and therefore the will of the people doesn't really matter. Unless, of course, it corresponds with what they think is what should be done, and then, oh, they're all for democracy then. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, at least in the words she spoke, was committed to triggering um, Article 50 early uh, next year. Brexit means Brexit, she said. The will of the people must be um, followed, adhered to, respected. But uh, this week, there was a legal challenge in the High Court in London, uh, led by a uh, millionaire um, city uh, of London uh, fund manager called Gina Miller and a few others I'll come to, um, to block the triggering by the government of Article 50 without um, a vote in Parliament. And, of course, what uh, Ms Miller uh, uh, said, that she was doing this to protect parliamentary democracy. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, that actually is not what it's about. You see, there's a, there's a majority in the Houses of Parliament that does not want Britain to leave the EU. So by um, taking it back there and having the, um, the uh, members of Parliament and unelected uh, House of Lords decide what will and will not happen with regard to Brexit, despite 
17.4 million people voting to come out and the majority in the referendum. Um, that means that we are now in a situation, unless the government wins its appeal, where a majority of members of parliament who want to stay in the EU now have enormous control over where Brexit goes from here. They can um, block it, they can delay it, they can water it down to the point where it's not Brexit at all, but just membership of the European Union under another name. And ideally, what they want to do is to bring about um, another second referendum. This is what happens when you go against the EU in a referendum. You've seen it all over Europe. Um, they then have another referendum and they overturn the result of the first referendum, which they didn't like. And um, so now um, the will of the people in the referendum is now being usurped by um, Parliament uh, and members of Parliament. And it is um, a situation that is frankly outrageous, disgusting, despicable, but in some ways a positive thing because it is showing people in their face that the financial and political class couldn't give a damn about what they want. Because this country, like every other country, is not run for the people. It's run for the political and financial classes. And like I keep saying, the hidden hand networks that work through those classes. So we're um, asked to believe uh, by this Gina Miller, who is um, a city fund manager and um, married to uh, a city slicker um, who's even got a, a well-known nickname in the city as um, Mr. Hedge Fund. And they uh, apparently run a uh, uh, an investment operation, which according to reports, has portfolios worth around £100 million. So they're regular people, just like the rest of us. And she asks us to believe that this legal challenge um, to the government's right to trigger Brexit without a parliamentary vote is about process. It's not about politics. It's about politics, Gina, isn't it? And you know it. Here we have um, a lady who says that she was so horrified by the uh, Brexit vote that it made her, quote, physically sick. So here we're being asked to believe that someone so vehemently um, in favour of staying in the EU has simply um, thrown this spanner in the works of uh, the Brexit process simply because she believes in parliamentary democracy and she wants to protect it. That, Gina would be the parliamentary democracy that your uh, fantastic, um, what could be wrong with it, EU, has spent the last more than 40 years destroying, with more and more laws being um, made by dark suit bureaucrats outside of this country, never mind outside of Parliament. This is the EU that is a, a bureaucratic tyranny, taking away and deleting year on year on year the right of sovereign parliaments to make decisions about what happens in their country. But you, uh, 
a supporter of the European Union in the extreme, and all that, I've only um, done this to throw the Brexit process into turmoil because you believe in parliamentary democracy. They really do think we're all freaking idiots. But as they found in the referendum, we ain't. Um, this is a quote from Gina Miller, um, who's only doing it to protect the process. I felt physically sick, she said, when the referendum result came through, because I thought, I don't think people know the ramifications of this of what's happened, and I felt really sorry that people had been tricked and fooled. You see, the financial and political classes, they know best, you see. So if you are just a, an ordinary person, just one of the great unwashed, then um, you really don't know anything about anything. You haven't worked out that um, Britain has lost control um, of, of its own country to the European Union. You haven't worked out all the um, European laws and regulations that are dictating, uh, uh, the, 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 like I say, the fine detail of your life and what you can do and can't do. You haven't worked out that, that, um, that smaller companies are being crushed by the weight of EU regulation that's destroying their ability to function. You can't work that out. You have to leave it to those who know best the city financiers and the politicians. You're just, you're just the man in the street, the woman in the street. What do you know? She goes on. Uh, we must not underestimate or forget the anger in Europe. Oh, really, I'm terrified about our vote. They're very angry that we've had this relationship, yet we still threaten the union. Well, they should be angry then. Actually, there's a, a, a vast number of people in other European countries that want to do the same that Britain did and vote to come out. They're not being given the chance because the political class that knows best is terrified that they might do the same. It's extraordinary. Now, let's have a look at these other people who were behind this um, legal challenge in which um, judges uh, decided that uh, it had to go to Parliament for a vote before Article 50 could be triggered and could not just be done by the government carrying out the will of the people. Um, the organisation behind this, or one of them, is called People's Challenge. Who are these people? Um, it was set up in the summer by a guy called Graham Pigney, uh, a British expatriate. He now lives in France. And Paul Cartwright, who is a Gibraltar national and uh, works as uh, an environmental officer for the Gibraltar government. Was, was Gibraltar in England or Scotland or Wales? Uh, Northern Ireland, the last time you were alive, I, I don't believe it was. Mr. Pigney, originally from Fairham in Hampshire, is a semi-retired uh, man and has lived in a wine growing region of Carcassonne for 19 years. So the, one of the people behind this doesn't even live in the country and has lived in France for 19 years. Um, and he wants to, um, in effect, that, that's, that, that's, let's be but he's open and sensible about it. He wants to block Brexit. That's what this is really all about. No, it's the process. Anyway, also backing this legal action um, that won this uh, ruling this week uh, is an organisation called Fair Deal for Expats Group. Well, expats. So they don't live in England either, or Britain. No. Uh, it includes among them dozens of Britons living abroad. Oh, anyone notice the theme here? Um, and these include a British company director who lives in France, seems to be a popular place, 
Um, a businessman who runs holiday rentals uh, in um, Italy and an English language teacher in Hamburg, Germany. I never saw Britain get a mention there. Mr. Pigney defended his decision to launch People's Challenge. He said, I happen to live in uh, France, but that is inconsequential incon in the context of the constitutional crisis we are facing. The constitutional crisis that your challenge is just massively uh, added to, by the way. And it's not inconsequential. Um, he, he says here, what's at stake is nothing less than parliamentary sovereignty. We need to make sure we do not hand the sovereignty of the UK to a self-appointed government. Well, what do you mean the sovereignty that's being handed to, to uh, in effect, self-appointed bureaucrats for the last 40 odd years? And of course, it's not inconsequential that someone who starts a legal challenge affecting uh, uh, the uh, vote of 17.4 uh, million people actually has lived in another country for 19 years. Uh, another guy um, in this uh, group um, is, a, is, is a Brazilian-born hairdresser who no one seems to know um, much about. And that is the organisation with their 12 barristers, obviously money no object there, who have um, created a situation where the anti-EU majority or the anti-leave-the-EU uh, majority in Parliament now potentially, unless this government um, appeal is successful, now have um, enormous control over the Brexit process, how fast it moves, uh, the nature of what it is, etc. And that's the whole point of what has happened here. And um, the judgment um, was made by uh, three judges, um, including uh, one, the Lord Chief Justice, who actually is a co-founder of an organisation dedicated to integrating um, laws um, all over Europe into uh, one EU uh, uh, group of laws that are basically all the same. In other words, centralising control in Europe via the legal system. And, you know, in the last uh, 24 hours, day or two, since this judgment was made, um, we have uh, we have seen so many extraordinarily ludicrous things said, like it's just about the process, not politics. Um, and another one is um, I saw that the judgment was made by an independent judiciary uh, acting above politics and outside politics. You know, you know, you know the the the, the greatest threat to humankind. It's frickin' naivety. The idea that the judiciary is above politics and the judiciary is independent is absolutely ludicrous. Like I say, what it's really about is blocking Brexit um, or watering it down to the point where it ain't Brexit at all. And that's beyond all the bullshit, that's exactly what this is about. And it's, it's sickening to me anyway, to see this group who call themselves progressives, word that came out of America, basically those of, of the left and greens and all these people, people call themselves liberals, um, to see them lining up alongside and cheering when when they came out of the High Court, um, the um, city uh, millionaires and lining up alongside the financial and political class uh, in demanding, in effect, that the will of the people is not adhered to and we stay in the EU. Here we have these so-called, because that's what they are, so-called progressives who um, will 
go on marches and protest against the extremes of the financial class and the political class that they don't agree with, or that part of the political class they don't agree with, while um, they now stand alongside of them uh, to defend democracy by destroying it. They stand alongside people like Tony Blair, a man who so loves parliamentary democracy that he lied to Parliament to justify a catastrophic war that has cost the lives of uh, millions of people, um, both uh, in Iraq and as a result of what that invasion of Iraq has done since in terms of the Middle East. A man who didn't even keep his own cabinet informed of what was going on in relation to the invasion of Iraq. These progressives, the British equivalent of the bullshitter uh, in the United States, a classic fake progressive Michael Moore, are now standing shoulder to shoulder with people like Tony Blair. It is absolutely pathetic. And um, we're seeing, see, we are in a, 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 a point now where things are coming to the surface, where we can't ignore them anymore. This is why you've got that quote from the Daily Mail using the word conspiracy of the political class against the people. It's becoming blatant. Look at the Clinton emails, how they've shown the collusion with the media, how they collude to uh, um, block the candidates like Bernie Sanders that they don't want, how um, behind the scenes they're saying exactly the opposite to what they're saying in public, and how the whole system is so deeply, shockingly, unspeakably corrupt and now we're having this put in our face again in Britain. The political class and that which was behind the political class, which, like I say, most of the political class doesn't even know that hidden hand exists. While it does its bidding, just like the progressives, global warming, um, political correctness, stay in the EU, these are all... Uh, desires of the hidden hand, which the progressives play out, thinking they're being progressive. It's hilarious if he wants a tragic. Um, you know, we've reached the point now where we, the people, have got to say enough. We've got to stop cooperating with this system of corrupt mendacious control and stop handing our power to it. They have the power to dictate our lives because we give that power to them. How can their number dictate to millions of people, globally billions of people? They can't unless those millions and billions give their power away to them. We've got to stop it because it's becoming more blatant and therefore more obvious, because it's becoming more extreme. And um, the naivety of people, like I say, um, is extraordinary, um, as we're seeing this week. Um, I saw uh, this post, it's just an example of endless ones on social media just after this uh, judgment was made, from a guy called Martin Cuff, whoever he is. Um, One day, we'll thank Gina Miller for saving the entire notion 